This year, Australians will make one of the most important political decisions of their lifetime. They'll be voting to either change or preserve our nation's rule book. That is, the Constitution, by enshrining a new institution, the voice, which would make special representations to the parliament and to the executive on an extraordinary range, if not all, policy matters that might come before the government. Prime Minister Anthony Albanese has called this a modest and gracious change. A generous, modest and gracious offer. Unfortunately, far from being modest, as has been observed and clearly pointed out by many senior journalists, constitutional experts and lawyers, it may be the most radical and unpredictable constitutional alteration in our history and yet the Prime Minister and his team have not been able to clearly define the exact nature of this beast or why it would make a difference. Proponents of the voice to Parliament argue it would be a first step towards national unity, truth-telling and closing the gap, or in other language, a treaty, reparations and truth-telling. And all that that entails, it should be remembered that the Prime Minister has committed to the Uluru Statement in full, and it makes it plain that the voice is, as one activist has put it, simply the hook upon which these later measures are to be hung. In reality, the voice would permanently institutionalise racial politics. It would perpetuate unjustified intergenerational guilt and it would divide Australians according to their race. An overwhelming number of Australians, myself included, my family have been involved and intertwined with Aboriginal communities now since the 1820s. I went to school with Aboriginal people. I represented a large number of Aboriginal people. We want to see the gap of disadvantage between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians closed. We also want to see Aboriginal Australians recognised, most appropriately, I think, in a preamble to the Constitution. But a constitutionally enshrined voice would only exacerbate division rather than solve disadvantage. And it does strike me indeed that if the objective is to close the gap and to end disadvantage, why would you lock it into the Constitution in perpetuity? That is to imply that its work will never be finished and will always be looking for areas of disagreement. Here are four myths that are used to justify support for the voice. First, the idea that Aboriginal people are not fairly represented in our parliament. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people make up 3.2% of the national population, yet they make up 4.8% of federal politicians. That means there are actually more Indigenous parliamentarians than other Australians when considered in proportion to the population on the whole. Indigenous politicians often reflect too the diverse range of views of Indigenous Australians as a whole, from independent Senator Lydia Thorpe to National Senator Jacinta Price. And this is a very important point, of course. Indigenous Australians, like everyone else, have a wide range of interests, of perspectives, and of views on the best national policy prescriptions. The truth is our parliament represents Aboriginal people surprisingly well. We should celebrate this achievement rather than seek to ignore it and brush it aside and say, we need a better way of going around it. Secondly, the idea that there is not enough institutional help for Indigenous Australians is a myth that I think needs exposing. The National Indigenous Australian Association directly funds over 1,100 organisations that work to improve the lives of First Nations people. And perhaps it might be wise to have a look at why it has failed in some areas before we consider yet another body. That body is also responsible for $4 billion of annual funding that goes specifically to Aboriginal organisations. 
There are over 50 peak councils in Australia that represent thousands of in Aboriginal bodies. And within the Commonwealth Government, there is a dedicated Indigenous Affairs Minister, and there are equivalent ministers and departments in our state and territory governments. I believe there are more than enough structures assisting Indigenous Australians in need. The issue is, what are they doing with all of these resources, willingly granted, I think, by the Australian people, because they do care. We want them to do better, but we don't need a new additional layer of bureaucracy locked into the constitution in perpetuity. Third is the myth that Aboriginal people haven't benefited from participating in modern Australia. The explanatory memorandum for The Voice argues that Indigenous disadvantage is caused by the ongoing effects of European settlement. Now, it is true that Aboriginal Australians suffered serious and traumatic consequences because of settlement, but it's not the full historical picture. Australian history also shows that many Indigenous Australians have loved and benefited from the fruits of European settlement. Of course, a great many Indigenous Australians continue to do so today. It's a far more complex picture than the simplistic view that's being pushed out there by activists. Australian anthropologist William Stanner wrote, for every Aboriginal who had Europeans thrust upon him, at least one other had sought them out. More would have gone to European centres sooner if it had not been that their way was often barred by hostile Aboriginals. The voice puts the blame for Aboriginal disadvantage on Australian society. This is a myth. Aboriginal disadvantages are caused by many factors, not just one. Renowned academic Peter Sutton has made the unpopular point that the most disadvantaged Aboriginal communities are the least colonised. The benefits, because there are benefits, that Western culture, science, technology and indeed public life have brought to all Australians should not be underestimated. And the truth is that many Indigenous communities struggle with entrenched social issues that negatively impact a wide range of Australians. A wide range. Fatherlessness, family breakdown, issues I'm passionate about, and they are massive problems faced by many Indigenous children. Some Indigenous communities also remain distant, it has to be said, from essential services like schools, hospitals and jobs. And the question must be asked, what's happened to the resources that have been made available and not properly audited in what we're told are programs that should have addressed these problems? It is simplistic and misleading to attribute all disadvantage to colonisation when there are these and other deep challenges that have multiple causes and, sadly, affect a wide range of Australians. By placing the blame on history, supporters of The Voice present an incomplete view of that history and distract from the tragic reality of generational welfare dependency, fatherlessness, social breakdown, and other factors contributing to the plight of disadvantage. Fourth, there is a grand hope that the voice would unify the country, but the evidence tells a different story, and this is very important. Recent Gallup polling reveals a dramatic decline in the health of our race relations over the last eight years, despite all of the symbolic acts and other activities undertaken by leaders who have told us that they will improve relationships. Despite decades of Indigenous land rights, a national apology, the widespread involvement in, of Indigenous ceremonies in our national events, and tens of billions of dollars spent every year to close the gap, we haven't closed it. Like all race politics, the voice pits group against group. It would simplistically hold current Australians to account for past wrongs. It would create a mentality of victims and villains, us and them. And it would subvert our democratic process by dividing citizens on the basis of race and creating a special group right in the national rulebook. The yes case, no matter how well intentioned, presents considerable social and legal risks. Australians should consider these risks very carefully before casting their vote.
At best, the voice will hinder parliamentary processes. It will expose legislative decisions to High Court challenges and it will place a heavy burden on Australian taxpayers. At worst, the voice will undermine our system of representative democracy and it will change the constitutional relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. Our constitution contains eight chapters which give structure to the separation of powers between the parliament, the executive government and the judicial system. This balance of power was very carefully thought out and set up by our forebears and it is based on the principle that every Australian should be subject to the same rule book. No one should be above the law and no one below it. Australians at the referendum will vote on whether to add a new chapter in the Constitution Chapter 9, which establishes this new institution, the Voice to Parliament. This will give the Indigenous voice a very special status alongside those other branches of government, changing the balance of power in our political system. And yet the actual design of the voice is proposed to be determined only after the vote. It is no wonder that people are likening this to signing a blank cheque. Such a serious change to the Australian Constitution would be a very weighty thing to undertake. Here are five more reasons why I'm encouraging Australians to vote against it. Firstly, there has not been a proper consultation with the Australian people, or it would appear Indigenous people. Unlike the Republic referendum did back in the late 1990s, these alterations have not gone through a proper review via a constitutional convention. When Australians were asked to vote for their constitution back in 1900, they were given a complete draft of it to carefully examine and consider. But today, we Australians are being told to vote now and then find out later just what we have voted for. Astonishingly, the truth is that even our politicians don't know what they will create. Our nation's founding fathers would be aghast. Considering the magnitude and permanence of constitutional change, this is a dangerous and, I believe, wrong approach. Secondly, the voice would undermine the principles of our representative democracy by encouraging race-based identity politics. When politicians are elected, their race, age or sex is irrelevant to the solemn duty they have to the Australian people. Take my friend and colleague, Senator Jacinta Price, who faithfully represents, to the best of her very considerable ability, all of her constituents in the Northern Territory, not just those who share her Indigenous heritage or gender. The voice to Parliament, however, would be an unelected body with members selected in part on the basis of race. This would create a fundamental division between Australians. Thirdly, the voice would hinder the work of Parliament. Constitutional law expert Peter Garangulis, among others, argues that the voice could force the government through the courts to listen to its advice and stall its procedures. The possible use of the courts has been identified as desirable by Professor Marcia Langton, who is a leading architect of The Voice. From an interview with an ABC journalist, and I quote, if a government decision is made without listening to The Voice, it could be challenged in the High Court and potentially stopped from being implemented until The Voice had been heard. That is a possibility, and why would we not want that to be the case? This doesn't sound like the modest advisory body being sold to the Australian people by the Prime Minister. Fourthly, a very practical point needs to be made. The voice would place a heavy burden on the taxpayer. The Australian taxpayers are being very generous when it comes to trying to alleviate Aboriginal disadvantage. That is a good thing. It is telling that the Albanese government has not outlined how much the voice will cost the Australian taxpayer each year. The government would have to fund its infrastructure, the salaries of each delegate, the cost of elections, the resources to give advice on policy and the consultation of experts. This is on top of the 364 million it will cost to deliver the referendum itself. 
costs are also likely to blow out over the coming decades, which is exactly what happened in Canada. Canada's Assembly of First Nations was established in 1982. And like the proposed voice, it advises the government on all laws that affect the Indigenous peoples of Canada. Since 2016, its annual costs have more than doubled from 11.5 billion to 25 billion in 2022, which is now more than Canada spends on defence. Worst of all, according to Dr. Tom Flanagan, a senior fellow at one of Canada's largest think tanks, through all these decades of steadily increasing spending, the gap in living standards between First Nations people on reserves and other Canadians have remained almost exactly the same. Fifth, the voice would undoubtedly lead to long and protracted litigation in the High Court. Previous High Court judge Ian Callanan wrote that it would lead to a decade of litigation. And constitutional law professor Greg Craven, who was part of a small group that designed the concept of the voice, is now saying that in the form that it's evolved, it has turned into the opposite of what was intended. His point is that because the proposed voice will be able to advise the executive government in addition to parliament profoundly multiplies the scope of its impact from major national security decisions down to, as he put it, where to cite a lighthouse. According to Professor Craven, it's become highly apparent that indigenous activists want constitutional challenge for breakfast, lunch and tea. Ultimately, Australians cannot know what The Voice is and what it does until the High Court tells them, and that will only be after the politicians have designed it, because at this stage we don't know what their design looks like. It would be reckless to make these changes to the Constitution without considering these issues. Instead of creating a whole new chapter in the Constitution, which would undoubtedly lead to High Court challenges, to stalled, gummed up parliamentary processes, and an undermining of our representative democracy, I believe Indigenous people should be acknowledged in the preamble of the Constitution in an appropriate way. Done properly, Indigenous people can be recognised for their unique status as inhabitants prior to European settlement of this ancient land. They can be honoured in a way that brings all Australians together rather than divides. Supporters of The Voice say it will close the gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. Because the gap isn't closing fast enough. But The Voice would likely do very little to close the gap. It may make it worse because it sadly appears to be just another project in a long line of failed attempts, often aiming at the wrong issues, often addressing issues in less than optimal ways. One example of this kind of distraction is the persistent focus on native title as though it can genuinely affect outcomes for disadvantaged Australians. It may surprise you to know that native title claims cover at least 43% of Australia's landmass and 143,000 square kilometres of ocean. I repeat, getting on for one half of Australia is listed under native title. Now this does enable Indigenous people to carry out important cultural practices on traditional land, but what it hasn't done and isn't doing is improving their socioeconomic conditions, their health outcomes or opportunities. Indeed, it's estimated that 80% of Indigenous Australians live functional lives. Many of the remaining 20% are in tragic circumstances. There can be no doubt about the need to act on those. It's a question of how we do it. And to help address the everyday issues facing this group of struggling Aboriginal people, what is really needed is focus on the primary causes of disadvantage and marginalisation. One such cause that is close to my heart is the issue of fatherlessness and community dysfunctionality in general. But fatherlessness in particular creates broken and dysfunctional families where kids suffer the most. 
Beyond well-known examples of this brokenness, like welfare dependency and alcoholism, is the issue of education. Only 14% of children in remote Northern Territory communities regularly attend school. We don't need a constitutionally enshrined initiative from the same stable of failed attempts that have left us where we are today. But recognising Indigenous people in the preamble is no panacea either. What we really need, more than a preamble and certainly more than a troublesome voice, is courage to address the true causes of Indigenous disadvantage with honesty. It might mean some humility as well. In our willingness to listen and in the setting of our expectations, we need to understand what lawmakers and regulators can do and what they can't do. Because for this portion of disadvantaged Australians, the difficulties run deep. And to see real gains, they'll need generations of sustained community-driven effort, not just government-imposed responses. In addition to a raft of other concerns, I believe the referendum and the proposed voice it represents is a distraction from the real problems facing these communities. I urge you to recognise a better way for us Aboriginal Australians. And that begins by voting no on this model for a so-called voice to Parliament.